right, we might as well get underway. Everyone hear me? Thumbs up. We're all on mute there, so just to the excellent. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the Irish Branches first event of the year. Uh, delighted to get it underway. Um, and obviously, we plan to do more later in the year on the back of on the back of this one. Um, remember it's your it's your branch it's your membership so what you want to see is what we'll do to Kate we'll cater it towards yourselves so if you have ideas on subjects or things you want to see us run or do then please email us and and we'll cater to that so island branch at cicm.com any any queries that way and we'll, we can help you out uh so look let's get underway i am delighted to um, get this event underway. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Hart and Jim Power uh, to, to run this today. Uh, Jason's going to, uh, to host it, basically. I'm gonna sit in the background and keep an eye on things, um, but I'm gonna pass over to, to Jason and Jim now um, to get started. So thanks very much, guys. Super, Paul. Um, thanks very much. Um, and again, uh, Mason Hayes is delighted to, to work with, with, with CICM um, um, on, on, on this event and, and into the future. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined today by one of Ireland's leading economists, Jim Power. Many of you might know that Jim Power was um, chief economist for the Bank of Ireland Group and, and for Friends First um, during, during uh, a, ha a happy lifetime. Um, He's now a very active economic commentator, um, particularly on his um, own podcast, The Other Hand, which he co-hosts with Chris Johns, another economist. J just to give you guys an overview as to what we're going to discuss, I want to cover the global economy um, briefly with Jim, maybe looking back to last year and the year ahead. Then we're going to zoom in to the Irish economy, discuss that somewhat, and then zoom in a little further to discuss the issues and concerns of credit managers in particular, particularly relating to the sectors within the Irish economy. We're going to speak maybe for 35 minutes or so, and then we'll um, hand back to Paul to take any Q&A that, that you guys have. Um, Jim, if I was to think back over the last couple of years, I think the key feature in all our lives was the COVID-19 pandemic and the public health restrictions that, that were brought in to, to, to try to, to, to manage that. And um, it's, it's, it's probably fair to say that out of COVID, you had um, a supply side um, uh, sticking points in, ter in terms of not being able to get um, goods and services. And there was also a, a pent up demand during COVID. And now I'm no economist, but that seemed to give rise to inflation. And the people then whose, whose brief it is to, to, to control inflation um, uh, had to look at how, how, how they were going to do that. And I think there was a view at the start of last year that inflation in the global economy was transitory. Um, was that a fair assessment of where we started? Well, uh, uh, good morning, Jason. I think um, the first lesson we should learn from the last three years, uh, I teach economics and first class every year is telling students you cannot forecast the future. There is no certainty in the world of economics because events happen that have a huge impact. I remember this time three years ago, you know, looking at the year ahead, I was pretty upbeat for the world economy ahead of a US presidential election. I felt a lot of this antagonism that Trump had towards Europe and China would ease down and that we'd be fair set for a reasonable year. And then of course, um, in early March, we had the declaration of a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. We then had, you know, a year, year and a half, depending on the jurisdiction, of significant levels of restriction everywhere. So basically what we saw happening was that a lot of supply shut down and a lot of demand was repressed in the sense that people were, a lot of people were still working and earning, but the ability to spend was seriously restrained. And likewise with businesses, put a lot of investment on hold during that 18 month period. And then as 2021 progressed, as the vaccine program was rolled out, as the global economy started to reopen, we saw this resurgence of repressed demand coming up against supply constraints. And you know, Economics 101 would tell you that when that happens, inflation starts to become a problem. 
And indeed, in the final months of 2021, we started to see inflation rates that we hadn't seen in 20 years at that stage. The view from central bankers this time last year was that this would be a transitory problem, that as 2022 progressed, supply chains would gradually come back on stream. This resurgence of repressed demand would level off and normalize, and then inflationary pressures would start to gradually ease and um, central banks didn't believe they would have to do very much in terms of increasing interest rates to bring inflation back under control. And then, of course, events on February 24th when Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, you know, that had a pretty dramatic impact. And, and I guess from an economic perspective, there's three key ways of looking at the Ukrainian war over the last 12, nearly 12 months at this stage. One is the impact it has had on energy. You know, we've seen serious problems with energy supply and indeed energy prices, particularly last summer into the autumn. Um, secondly, we saw global food supply chain be seriously disrupted because I don't, well, if, if some of us may have, a lot of us didn't. I certainly didn't realize um, until 24th of February last year just how important Ukraine is as the food basket of the world, really, particularly areas like wheat production and sunflower oil and so on. So we've had a serious shock to the global food supply chain. And then the third area sort of broadly defined is industrial metals, uh, lithium, uh, the stuff, lithium, nickel, palladium, the stuff that goes into electric batteries, for example, um, and a lot of other construction materials. So those three major shocks and um, the net result was that inflation really took off. And by October of last year, inflation everywhere was really running at the highest levels we'd seen in 38, 40 years. And central bankers also, as the year progressed, suddenly started to react to this. They now realize that inflation was becoming a bigger issue, that there was a significant risk. It would become embedded in the system in a sense that as economic actors, you know, we'd all start building in higher inflation into our behavior and inflation then starts to become embedded in the system. There is an old saying in economics, at least dating back to the stagflation of the 1980s after the two oil price shocks, that the persistence of inflation increases with the rate of inflation. So in other words, as the rate of inflation rises from month to month, we start to build it into our behavior and suddenly it becomes ingrained or entrenched in the system. And that more than anything else was what central bankers were scared about. And they reacted aggressively. You know, we saw uh, the Federal Reserve take rates from zero last March. Um, the latest increase saw rates go to 4.75% last week. We've seen the Bank of England take rates from zero to 4% over the last 12 months. And the European Central Bank has taken rates from zero in late July to um, 3%, the latest half percent being delivered last week. So central bankers are now acting aggressively to bring inflation under control. And uh, I think from a global economic perspective, um, inflation is going to be the dominant theme during 2023. Uh, there is a sort of a consensus view out there that as energy prices come back, and one of the things that has really happened in the last three or four months is that natural gas prices particularly have fallen dramatically. Um, you know, last August, natural gas prices in Europe were trading at almost 350 euro. Uh, the equivalent today is about 55, 56 euro. So that's a collapse. Um, and, and, and oil prices have also come back a bit. So that will feed into headline inflation. And indeed, since October, we've seen it start to come back. But central bankers are certainly not relaxed about it at the moment. They still believe they have further to do on the interest rate front to bring inflation under control. So after four decades of its absence, inflation really is the global theme at the moment. And, and as you say, very much, very much part of the landscape. So like you said there, I think um, timing is everything in, in economics. And maybe, Jim, if we had done this webinar a month ago or certainly two months ago, uh, and we were talking about the economic forecasts that were out there at the time, it would be more on the pessimistic side, but 
I saw the the IMF um, um, report uh, looking into into the year ahead was released last week, and um, they had revised upwards their their projections. I think so that that for the global economy, they they might see a a global growth rate of just under three percent. I think um, for twenty twenty three and a little more than that in in, in twenty twenty four. Um, are you uh, as optimistic, uh, or um, mm. would you have a sense of pessimism for, for the year ahead for the global economy? Well, the you know, uh, looking at all the official and private sector forecasts that were produced towards the end of last year, very, very downbeat. Yeah. There was a lot of talk about global recession, there was a lot of talk about a really difficult year for the global economy. Um, last year, the International Monetary Fund published three three forecasts on, on each occasion. It successively revived down its global growth forecast for 23. Last week saw the first upgrade. Okay, and it was modest from 2.7 to 2.9 percent global growth for this year. And to put that in context, you know the world economy should be delivering growth four and a half five percent. That would be normal. Right. So it's significantly below potential, but at least it's moving in the right direction. And two things have changed the mood music over the last six weeks or so. One is the fact that after a year of COVID-related restrictions, the Chinese economy is back in business. And as the world's second largest economy, that is going to make a greater contribution to global growth. And the second issue that I've mentioned, energy prices, particularly natural gas prices, have fallen back significantly. So that's that really is the reason for the slightly more upbeat assessment but i wouldn't get carried away about it you know the the in the imf forecast the united kingdom for example was the only g7 economy forecast to contract by 0.6% um this year um and and everywhere else in europe you're looking at pretty flat growth so i wouldn't get carried away about it because the global headwinds are still strong. You know, the Ukraine war is ongoing. It's showing no signs of how it might end. And in fact, there's a distinct risk it could escalate. Uh, um, interest rates continue to rise. And uh, it was clear from all three central bankers last week, but in the case of the US Federal Reserve and the Bank of England, um, there was a suggestion, actually, we are approaching the top of the cycle. There's a little bit further to go. Whereas in Europe, the European Central Bank, who was later to the game, it started later than the others, and also has not increased rates by as much as others. You know, it is still suggesting that rates could rise another half percent in March and perhaps more after that. So all of these things will impact on global activity. But um, I, I think the, the big uncertainty in the background, you know, is outside the realms of economics as such. It's the Ukraine war and how that actually evolves. And I, I guess my concern there is that it's not at all obvious what the off-ramp here is for Putin, you know, how this might end. And it's just a distinct risk. It just continues to uh, rumble on for the foreseeable future. And of course, as the IMF pointed out last week, one of the global risks this year is if that situation escalates again and starts to seriously disrupt energy and food supply chains again, because some of those pressures have eased so um, it's a little bit better, a little bit more upbeat than you would have been even a month ago. But uh, it'd be naive to believe that these challenges are not there. You know, they are there. That's how we deal with them. Um, certainly nothing to get to get carried away about, so I should say. Um, if we zoom in then, Jim, maybe um, to the Irish economy and we look back at the Irish economy's performance uh, last year, uh, it seems to me to be a good news story um, and one metric in particular that jumped out at me was the fact that uh, our tax revenue rose by a whopping 22% um, year on year. Uh, tax rose to, I think, eight, just over 83 billion euros, which was um, 14 billion ahead of the previous year and um, 24 billion then ahead of 2019, the last year um, pr prior to the pandemic. Um, that seems to be... to on that, at least, to, to indicate an economy that's in, in really good health? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess for the Irish audience here this morning, they'd be aware of this, but for um, the international participants in this call, um, it's important to understand in an Irish context that gross domestic product, GDP, which is the international 
measure of economic activity. Um, it is. It needs to be treated with extreme caution in an Irish context. Uh, preliminary data from our central statistics office suggests that GDP last year expanded by 12.2%, which is by far the strongest growth rate of any country around the world last year. Um, Irish GDP is grossly exaggerated by uh, some of the activities of the multinational sector. So back, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2015, and subsequently we saw uh, a lot of intellectual property assets being um, brought into Ireland for tax reasons. We Aircraft leasing is a massive industry in this country. But both of those activities form part of GDP, but their relevance on the ground in the economy is limited. Okay, so the Central Statistics Office, um, I don't want to give me a lesson in economics here, but it's important to understand no, it in an Irish context. The Central Statistics Office has adjusted Irish GDP to try and get a more representative measure of what's happening on the ground. And it comes up with a measure called Gross National Income Star, GNI Star. It has no international resonance. It's purely a domestic construct to help us understand what's happening in the economy. And while we don't have the outcome yet for last year, it is likely that GNI Star grew by about 5%. Okay, nothing like what GDP is suggesting, but still a very, very good performance given the global backdrop. And I think the key elements, I'll get back to the taxation bit in a second, that's really important. But the export side of the economy boomed last year. Um, exports in the first 11 months up about 26%. Uh, the labor market incredibly strong. At the end of September, we had 2.55 million people in employment, which is the highest ever. The unemployment rate in January at 4.4% of the labor force, which is virtually full employment. So the Irish labor market, incredibly strong, the export performance incredibly strong, and foreign direct investment into the country is still very, very strong. And the Industrial Development Authority here, the body with responsibility for attracting foreign direct investment had another record year in terms of employment creation. So there's a lot of positive stuff happening in the economy, there's no doubt about that. But um, you know, I have I have over the years got involved in many ideological debates or rows or spats. You do, uh, yeah. Yes, Jason, absolutely. About um, you know, economists being accused of being obsessed with GDP, not caring about society. I would always argue that to create a society, you need a functioning economy because economic activity generates the tax revenues that then fund everything else in society. And Ireland over the last couple of years is a really good example of this in marked contrast to the UK, for example. Uh, the Irish economy growing very strongly has delivered very strong tax revenue growth. Um, as you mentioned, we last year we collected 83 billion up 22%, which is the highest level of taxation we've ever collected. The income tax take which accounts for about 39% of the total, very strong, reflecting the strong employment performance. But the bit that stands out is the corporation tax side. We collected just over 22 billion this year. 10 years ago, we'd have been lucky to collect 4 billion. Um, and that's reflecting 85% of corporation tax is paid by the multinational sector, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you want to delve down further, 10 companies, all multinationals, we surmise, because uh, for confidentiality reasons, the Revenue Commissioners obviously won't let us know who they are. But 10 companies account for about 55% of the corporation tax take. And um, so there, there is a concentration risk here. Um, and that's the bit you'd be concerned about, you know, some global development, such as what's happening on the global technology front at the moment, the profitability of global technology companies is under pressure. They're shedding employment to bring costs back into line again. And there is a distinct risk that that could start to reflect in weaker corporation tax take here. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be terribly pessimistic about it. I think there will be some reduction, but um, the Department of Finance here is very conscious and is very risk averse as a Department of Finance should be really but the Department of Finance is arguing that up to 10 billion of that 22 billion 
could be at risk at some stage. So government don't go out there and spend all of this money just in case um, it disappears at some stage. Uh, but as we stand at the moment, or sit, um, the tax revenue situation is really strong. And Ireland, back in September 27, delivered um, a budget package of 11.2 billion euro, which is the highest or the largest budget package we've ever seen in this country. And in marked contrast to Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget in the UK in October, the budget package here was totally funded out of a budget surplus on the back of tax revenue buoyancy. So, uh, so in a nutshell, Jason, yeah, the, the Irish economic momentum is still good. There's no doubt about that. Um, but given all of those global headwinds, rising interest rates and so on, uh, you know, and, and I guess I would say this, wouldn't I, as a conservative economist, but we need to be a little bit cautious about um, how we treat it. But it's a good story. Fair enough. I suppose um, as as a debt collector, as a collector myself, um, when, when one sees um, collection figures like that for any given year, and the fact that they are collections as opposed to simply turnover, it always is going to be the, 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 the metric that, that, that jumps out. Um, you mentioned the employment figures. The employment situation here is obviously um, um, really healthy too. You had, made, you had um, I know, mentioned in the past too, um, household savings are very strong as well. But there are um, other things that suggest that um, there are difficulties and challenges too in, in, in our economy. And um, inflation and the ever-rising spectre of um, interest rates which we obviously can't control, that's set by the, the ECB. Um, what do you see happening on inflation in Ireland specifically um, over the year ahead? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on the labour market front, uh, it is a good story, an economy that's virtually full employment. And for many Irish businesses, and indeed this is not unique to Ireland in the last year, uh, the recruitment and retention of workers has been a key issue and wage pressures have been rising in most jurisdictions. Um, the, I guess if you're to look for a challenge from that labor market performance, the thing that stands out is what's happening on the global technology front. Um, there's about 126,000 <clears throat> people employed in technology companies per se in this country. And um, we're, we've seen a lot of global technology companies announce um, announced job layoffs in recent times, on average about 10% of workforces, you know, inevitably that will have some impact here on the employment situation. But I think a lot of the workers that will be laid off in technology will be picked up in other sectors that couldn't compete with the big global tech giants over the last couple of years. So I'm, I'm relatively relaxed about the labor market situation. Um, in terms of inflation, uh, the headline rate peaked at 9.2% in October, um, fell to 8.2% in December, and the January, the preliminary estimation, I think it's going to be confirmed tomorrow, is about 7.7%. So it is starting to come down, but the key reason why it's coming down is because of energy prices, um, petrol, diesel, home heating oil, particularly, you know, reflecting on what's happening in global energy prices. So the energy components... Um, subject, obviously, to the um, caveat about the Ukraine war situation and its possible impact on future energy supply. But the, the hope would be that given the global energy balance at the moment, that energy prices will continue to exert downward pressure on headline inflation. There are other elements of inflation um, I'd be more concerned about. Food price inflation in December was running at 12%. And for 20 years, up to the end of 2021, um, food prices here on average had been declining. So we've seen a massive upsurge in food price inflation. So, and that's not likely to end soon. Okay, that, that will be the consensus view. So food price inflation will continue. And the other thing, we include mortgage rates in our measured inflation here. And um, in the year to December, mortgage the average mortgage cost was up about 22%. So that's feeding into inflation. So there's conflicting forces at play. But I would expect, and this is subject to the caveat of the, the impact of the Ukraine war situation, but I would expect 
the headline rate of inflation to probably fall to somewhere between four and five percent later this year and then in 2024 to come back further towards the European Central Bank's preferred target range of just under two percent. So I, I think we're past the peak of the inflation cycle. Uh, but I repeat again, this is subject to the caveat of the impact that Ukraine might have over the coming months on energy. And coming into next winter, as was the case coming into this winter, there will be lots of concerns about global energy supply. Um, thankfully, this year, due to a combination, uh, particularly of warm weather, a very warm winter in Europe, uh, natural gas stocks have been built up to very, very significant levels. So we've missed the crisis this year, but inevitably we will see talk about that coming into, coming into next winter. Uh, but as I say, I think everywhere you're going to see the headline inflation rate gradually declining over the coming months. And of course, central bankers will be instrumental in that, in the sense that they are still in interest rate typing mode to try and get inflation under control. And central bankers have basically said, and, and I think this will feed through to a conversation we're going to have a little bit later on about debt collection and so on. But as interest rates, central banks have taken the view that um, they will do whatever it takes to bring inflation under control. And if that means forcing economies into recession or significant slowdown, higher unemployment, so be it. That is a price worth paying to get inflation under control. That is the view of central bankers. So, um, you know, rising interest rates remain yeah, an yeah. issue. And very, very much a feature. Um, I'm conscious, Jim, that many people on the call um, are, are in the credit management uh, sphere and that they'll be um, dealing with uh, the various sectors of, of the Irish economy. And they'll be, I've no doubt, very interested in your view on what's going to happen in, in, in some of those um sectors, particularly ones that um, where the focus may be on, on consumer spending. Um, what do you see happening there over the, the year ahead? Yeah, I think um, a, a real strong feature of the Irish economy over since the beginning of COVID, um, for the two years of COVID, it was a big feature. And in the last 12 months, it has remained a feature. And that is the dual nature of the economy and the labour market. So if you are operating in the multinational sector, financial services, professional services, um, the, those part and the public sector, those parts of the economy have been doing very well. Mm. Whereas other sectors such as hospitality, non-essential retail, personal services, they were the ones that were subject to the highest level of restriction during COVID-19. Um, and they are the sectors now, okay, there's, there's, there's a lot of debt, hard debt built up. And with the COVID supports now being gradually um, phased out, although there are energy supports in place at the moment, which will eventually be phased out as well. You know, I, I would fear that those sectors, number one, um, and I repeat, it's hospitality, it's non-essential retail, it's personal services, those sorts of businesses which are exclusively dominated by SMEs, in other words, companies that employ less than 250 people. They are the sectors that have the biggest legacy from COVID, but also they are now the sectors that are very dependent on discretionary spending. And with interest rates rising, with the cost of living pressure hitting some consumers harder than others, um, those are the sectors that would be vulnerable to a weakening of discretionary spending. And I think those are the sectors we need to keep a very, very close eye on. Uh, government will step in and continue to support with energy credits and so on. Uh, but fundamentally, those are sectors of the economy I would be concerned about at the moment. I think they could have a challenging 2023. Um, yeah, like obviously um, issues like interest rates and inflation will hit some, some businesses um, more than others. And I think everyone has agreed that um, we're going to see signs of distress in, in that part of the economy over, over the year ahead. Um, I think it's fair to say that insolvency numbers have been at somewhat of an artificial low over the past um, couple of years um, during COVID, particularly in light of, as you say, the, the, the government supports, but also a lot of um, 
predator forbearance and um, um, payment moratoriums, there were there were maybe uh, during the years after the Celtic Tiger, there might have been between fifteen hundred and two thousand insolvencies every year. Yeah. Whereas last year only only saw um, just under five hundred, I think. You know, um, there's a majority view. I think it's a majority view, at least, that insolvency numbers are likely to rise. And given from what you said, I presume that you'd be of that that view as well. Yeah, I would, Jason, because the insolvency numbers you mentioned are artificially low, and and that's reflecting, I guess, government policy since COVID um, erupted back in March 2020, and of course this forbearance for companies um, stretched into the Ukraine war for 2022 as well. So there is definitely an artificial cap being kept. At some stage, that cap will be lifted. And when it does, I think you will see um, a pickup in insolvencies. And I think um, a lot of those will be concentrated in the SME sector, in those sectors that I mentioned. You mentioned. Just to repeat, it's hospitality, it's personal service, type businesses it's non-essential retail and, and indeed um you know i've noticed here in dublin quite a few restaurants have actually folded in the last month or two or shutting down um so that that's that that is definitely one to keep an eye on but you, you're, you're correct you know there is sort of an artificial cap on it at the moment and, and indeed you could certainly say with the ban on evictions that's in place at the moment that is also an artificial cap and when that ban is eventually lifted, um, you will then see evictions rising again. So uh, it's it's a really, really unusual environment we've been operating in with two years of COVID, with the Ukraine war situation, and with the unprecedented level of government support that's been given to business and to households. And that is not unique to Ireland. It has been the response of virtually every government in the world over the last two or three years yeah um to varying degrees um uh very much so and i think um we can look to the uk where they would have opened up after covid um that 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 bit uh earlier the few maybe six months earlier than we did and their insolvency numbers certainly um have been shooting up over over um over 2022 yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to be concerned about with the UK economy. You know, as as I mentioned, uh, the IMF it was one of the only G7 countries forecast to contract this year. Um, you know, the the political backdrop in the UK um, is not filling one with confidence at the moment. And uh, I, I guess I go back to a personal hobby horse. Um, I think a lot of the problems started back in June 2016 with the vote for Brexit, you know, I have to say that from an economic perspective, I always believed Brexit was a barmy idea for the UK, you know, walking away from free access to a market of 450 million people to do trade deals with countries thousands of miles away, uh, in my view, was never a recipe for economic success. And uh, Yeah, there's there's quite a few I think, people from the UK on the call. Yes, so I, I probably insulted half. My apologise. I I'll um, uh, I I'll Paul will no doubt bring them in when I'm, when we take a, a bit of Q and A Q and A in a couple of minutes. Um, I, I, on that end, um, I, I'm going to um, bring our bit of the conversation to, to to a close um very soon. But um, before I do, I might just ask you to comment on the the housing situation in Ireland. Um, housing seems to me to be all pervasive. It's in every conversation that when, when we talk about the economy, whether it's restricting our competitiveness or whether it's um, um, in relation to um, young people of that generation in their 20s and, uh, and early 30s, how, how they can't get a house. Um, you've got the, the house price inflation that you mentioned, rental price inflation. Um, are we ever likely to get to grips with the housing situation in Ireland, Jim? And is it, is it an issue that will define Ireland's economy and Ireland's society? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the first point to make here is that Ireland's housing crisis is not unique to Ireland. You know, many countries struggle to deliver sufficient housing and we have homelessness problems. We have high rents, uh, high house prices in many jurisdictions. So we're not unique, uh, but it, it is definitely, in my view, from an Irish perspective, the biggest economic, social and political challenge facing the country. Um, you know, too often, well, I won't say too often, but the debate tends to be dominated by the social implications about 
you know, homelessness, about the inability of young people to move out from home to rent or to buy a house. Um, and that is definitely forcing my outward migration from the country. Um, a lot of my two sons' friends have actually gone to Australia in the last six months. It's quite phenomenal. And talking to them, it's really because they don't see any chance of getting on the housing ladder. You know, so, and that there's a social implication there. Uh, I'll get back to the economic piece, but politically, yeah. um, you know, Sinn Féin is currently at 35% in the opinion polls. It is the biggest party um, in op it's in opposition. And um, the, the view and, and Sinn Féin support is very strong in, amongst people aged between 20 and 40. And surprise, surprise, the one thing they have in common is that they are trying to get onto the housing ladder or are being forced onto a very expensive housing ladder either to buy or to rent. So politically, housing is having a huge impact on this political spectrum here. But the economic piece, I guess, is what I would focus in on most of all. Um, housing has got to be recognised as one of the most important elements of national competitiveness at this stage for the IDA attracting foreign direct investment and employment into Ireland. The availability of housing to buy or to rent is now becoming a serious issue. And for Dublin, it's a particular issue given you know, that prices are really elevated in this city. So it is a huge element of national competitiveness. Um, what's happening? Well, at a very fundamental level, there is a basic imbalance between supply and demand. I tend to bring everything back to supply and demand at the end of the day. But between 2011 and 2020, we delivered on average about just over 12,000 new housing units per annum. Uh, last year, 2022, we achieved 29,850, which is 40% higher than the previous year. So it's coming back. But, and this is the but, we should be delivering somewhere between 45 and 60,000 new housing units at the moment to accommodate the um, repressed demand that's in the system. And we still have a growing population. You know, in April 2022, the census shows we had over 5.1 million people living in the country. That is the highest population since the famine in the 1830s. Uh, I think it was the 1830s. And forties, um, thirties, forties. Okay, but <laughs> what's a decade when you're in the uh, But with a growing population and also a young population, you know, there's a lot of people in that twenty to thirty-five year old age group where household formation occurs. So there's yeah. a lot of natural demand. We're just not building enough houses. We need to do a lot of things to make it happen. We need to improve the financing model for developers. Um, we need to free up the planning process. We need to address the question of NIMBYism, people objecting to every development that is attempting to come on stream. There's a lot of things that need to happen to solve this housing problem. But I guess the bottom line, Jason, is that to get from 29,850 new housing completions last year to the 50 or 60,000 we need per annum is going to take a long time. It's going to be a major struggle. So I would be very surprised if you asked me back in three years to, 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 to conduct a similar discussion that I, we still wouldn't be talking about housing. Um, it, is the biggest, it is the biggest issue. You solve housing, you solve a lot of other economic and social problems. Um, no doubt. Um, Paul, before I, I hand back to you, um, Jim, I might just zoom out again and um, if I could ask you one last question then, if, I, um, if you could imagine yourself to be the economic advisor to, to someone or an entity that has, that has real economic power in the world, say the IMF or the US president or, or, or the World Bank, um, and over the next decade or so, um, if there was one key economic issue that they'll have to deal with, um, what would it be? And how would you advise them or counsel them to, I suppose, to make the world a better place? Well, actually, could, uh, could I pick two things? Okay, okay, okay. give me two. Uh, one is climate change. Um, you know, that has got to be the key 
uh, political focus over the coming years. And, um, you know, the, the one thing we should have learned from the last 12 months is the reliance on fossil fuels from politically unstable countries is really dangerous. So I think governments everywhere need to push the renewable energy agenda as quickly as possible. And here again, um, and it's a particular issue I know in this country, but I think it's the same in many countries, uh, there are massive objections to the development of renewable energy. Uh, but we've got to go there from the perspective of energy security and from the perspective of the climate. So I think that has to be a massive political focus with huge economic consequences. Uh, the second issue is inequality. Um, I, I certainly would believe that inequality is at the root of most political extremism we've seen arise over the last decade. Um, and, you know, the great financial crisis in, or the global financial crisis in 2007, 2008, uh, we're still living with the legacy of that. It has created massive inequality globally. And if you do not address inequality, you see the rise of extreme politics. And um, Trump in the United States was a prime example of that. Um, I, I think the actual Brexit debate in the United Kingdom a lot of it has its roots in inequality as well. So I, I think governments around the world need to get much, become much more serious about addressing inequality. You cannot just have this massive widening gap between the very well off and the much less well off in society. If you do, um, you're gonna have huge economic, social and political turmoil. Um, so, so rising out today, we have to try to fix the housing crisis in Ireland and then um, if climate change and change. inequality, in yeah, inequality globally. Um, tall order, it's a tall order, absolutely. Well, that, that's the problem you see about economics. Uh, the political will, um, to do these things is the real question because if the political system is not seriously interested in addressing these problems, these problems will not be solved. Yeah, yeah, that's the reality. Yeah. Um, Paul, on that note, I'm going to hand back to you if you want to open up um, for a Q&A for, for, for Jim or myself. Yeah, certainly. Uh, so thanks very much. I found that very, very good, very informative. Um, if anyone has any questions they want to ask Jim, um, please shoot them through the chat. Uh, there is a comment there from earlier um, about the, when you were talking about the the national debt and the and the income from the from the tax um and they've just commented to say that ireland still has a very large national debt as well um even though we oh. we collected on the you know we did well with the surplus and whatever okay so, Paul, if, 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 if i may address that point uh, it's, it's it's a very valid point um last year we ran a budget surplus of about five billion okay but we have a national debt of about 226 billion and to put that in context it's Roughly 90% of GDP, sorry, I beg your pardon, I'll, I'll rephrase this. This is where the GDP, GNI star piece comes in. If you measure that 226 billion as a percentage of GDP, it's close to 40%. You know, it's one of the lowest in Europe at the moment. So as a percentage of GDP, we don't have a problem. But if you measure it as a percentage of GNI star, which is a better way of looking at it, we're around 90%, which is high. So I would totally agree with the comment made by, the, by, by that viewer about Ireland still does have a significant level of government debt. And that's what kind of worries me, and it worries the Department of Finance at the moment, that because we're seeing all this tax revenue buoyancy on the corporate tax side particularly, that future governments will just spend that money. And, you know, Sinn Féin in opposition, they believe there's a money tree that they can spend money on everything and that will solve everything. That is a dangerous strategy because the one thing more than anything else we need to ensure is the importance of economic growth and the ability to deliver tax revenues. Economic growth is just essential. And I think the, uh, there's a guy, Tom Friedman, uh, US, who wrote a book 
10 or 15 years ago, read it many years ago, I've forgotten all about it until recently, called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. It was Benjamin Friedman, actually, not Tom. Um, but he wrote a book called The Economic Consequence, or sorry, The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. And he was basically making the argument that if a country is not delivering growth, um, it will not be able to generate the resources to address problems. And the UK currently stands out as a country that has not had real growth for a long time, underinvestment um, in everything. Um, and that is now putting serious strain on the National Health Service, for example. So economic growth is really important and policies need to be put in place to promote economic growth. And then the political decision is, how do you distribute the fruits of that economic activity? Um, and that, I guess, is what differentiates the left from the right in an ideological spectrum. Um, I, I felt the, the, the effects of that in the UK only um, last week myself in relation to uh, strikes and uh, seeking to get to get a, 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 tra a train back to the airport, as you say, when, when um, Wages aren't rising and um, inflation is. Um, yeah, they, people get they get very angry. Yeah, if you if you if you underfund public services, um, you inevitably have all sorts of problems. And March fifteenth, they're anticipating, I think, hundred thousand public sector workers in the UK, um, at least being on strike. Wow. Um, just another comment on that. Um, just under the tax revenue will have to be sustained for many years to come to pay the national debt. Which... Yeah, well, uh, you know, the thing about debt sustainability and, you know, as people involved in debt collection and so on, um, I think you, you would recognize that the sustainability of debt is heavily driven by your income. Okay, and uh, at a company level or at a country level. And if Ireland could continue to grow our economy by 4 or 5% per annum um, and control spending you know, in a reasonable way, um, the the sustainability of that debt situation does improve. So if you can grow your economy faster than you grow your debt, or as a company, if you can grow your income faster than you grow your debt, uh, it becomes more sustainable. So I go back to the point, um, and I'm not obsessed about this, but economic activity is really important because that does generate the resources that fund everything else. Um, and I would also just repeat the point that the notion that as a country, we just throw money at everything to make problems go away is just not a sustainable situation. And that's something that does worry me about the current political complexion in Ireland is this populist notion, there is a money tree, you can just spend money and all problems will go away. Um, if only it were that simple. Okay. Uh, just to look, someone looking for a comment on the construction industry economy at the moment, and your opinion on that. Okay. I mean, the as I said, the construction sector delivered 29,850 residential units last year, which is the highest we've seen since, I think, 2007 or eight, just before the thing crashed. Um, but the construction sector is facing many, many constraints at the moment. Um, the cost of materials have increased dramatically. ACOM published a report in the last couple of weeks, quantity surveyors showing that the average tender price was up by 16% last year. And that's reflecting the fact that concrete, timber, all of steel, of course, most importantly, all of the inputs into construction have increased dramatically. You're talking about anything from 20 to 40% year-on-year inflation last year. So the input costs for construction delivery have increased dramatically. And of course, uh, there was a COVID legacy issue there, which was compounded dramatically by the impact of the war in Ukraine. Um, and another big challenge for the construction sector here is capacity. Um, it's skilled workers, you know, in an economy that's virtually at full employment. Uh, skills shortages are becoming very apparent in the construction sector. So, uh, and then a third issue for the construction sector in terms of delivery is the funding model. Um, you know, funding developments, particularly for smaller developers and smaller builders, is really, really difficult at the moment. So, while the demand for construction output is incredibly strong, uh, the ability of the construction industry to deliver. 
um, it, because of costs, because of capacity constraints is challenged. There's no doubt about that. And uh, that's why, um, and I, if somebody had said this to me five years ago that I'd be saying stuff like this, I'd have laughed. But, you know, as time moves on and you see problems evolving, you realize that you do whatever it takes to solve these problems. And, and I think significant government intervention is needed to help fund the construction sector, to fund development. Um, and if that means giving, um, you know, over 40% of the price of a new house, for example, goes back to the state in VAT and development levies and other taxes. So giving a VAT holiday to developers for a couple of years to help deliver housing at an affordable cost. All of these things need to be considered now because housing is a national crisis. It should be a national priority. And when you're in a crisis, when something should be a priority, you throw whatever you can at it. And we did that during COVID. I think we need to adopt that attitude towards um, construction sector at the moment. And of course, politically, it's not easy. It's very unpopular. You know, anything that is deemed to be helping the evil developers is viewed as a bad thing. As you say, though, during COVID, um, we were able to turn the full resources of the state to dealing with the pandemic. Mm. And um, the the largest creditor, the, the Revenue Commissioners, um, be, became an entity that actually was making payments to people uh, uh, as opposed to collecting them. So it's probably fair to say where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, where there's a will, there's a way. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, you do. You just do what you have to do to address crisis and housing is definitely the number one crisis, in my view, facing this country. Okay, uh, look, we're, we're pushing on the hour there, so I think we'll we'll, we'll uh, round it off. There's no other questions in. Um, so I suppose on behalf of the CICM and all the people that have attended, Jim, thank you very much for today. I found that brilliant, and that was a great way to get our event started for this year. So very much appreciated. Thank you. And obviously, Jason from um, Mason, Hayes and Curran for... Um, for hosting and, and getting this organised for us. So it's very much appreciated. Um, we will be, so yeah, thanks again, guys. Um, we will be sharing that uh, Jim has some slides on the things he discussed here. So I will share them out to the, the people in there, uh, of the people in the, I'll email them out to everyone. <laughs> but if you have any specific questions, please feel free to email them through to the, the Island Branch email address. Um, so other than that, I think, We'll end it there and thanks very much for attending and thanks very much, uh, Jason and Jim, again. Thank you very much, Paul. You're welcome. Thanks everyone for attending. All right. Thank you.